hello there, people and listeners of the Hungry Hungry Podcast. <laughs> Um, I'm thrilled to welcome back for the third time Lottie Unwin. Yeah. Um, yeah, not many people have been on three times. So um, I, I've loved all our conversations. <laughs> it been super, super insightful. Um, Lottie is founder of Upworld, formerly Copy Club, um, and Brand Hackers, who help so many brands um, just, just kind of outsource marketing teams, fractional marketing teams. We work with them at Islands. Um, which is amazing. Ella's amazing. James is a good mate of mine. James been a pod. And um, yeah, there is so much to explore. And yeah, thank you so much. I'm, I'm excited for this. My pleasure. And um, we're sort of maintaining a weird friendship where we only talk on live podcast. <laughs> I know it's quite me. It makes them uh, it, ma- it makes them more natural, I suppose. Um, for sure. What I want to sure. <laughs> what I, what I start with is is what? Columbia. Yeah, you're uh, off. You were just about to go. It's uh, yeah, in like three weeks, basically, Sick. which yeah. is gonna be unreal. Yeah. Um, I want to. I I, I did a mooch through LinkedIn as I always do, mm. and I read I read this by you when you were in Columbus, saying exploring other cultures is humbling, and inspiring. I'm returned full of things I saw in Columbia that I want to bring to Upworld and Brand Hackers, yeah, um, and also reconnect with the charity we work with. Mm. I'm super excited to get out of there. What about Colombia? What did you learn in Colombia that you didn't expect to learn? Mm. Okay. So um, there are three very different things that come to mind now when you read that post to me. The irony is I've got absolutely no idea what I was on about then. So I'll, t- I'll tell you what I might have been thinking. Um, one was the practical stuff. So whenever I go to different cultures... I see new marketing, new routes to market, new retail environments that are different and are directly inspiring. So in Colombia, it was all the use of WhatsApp was just fascinating to me. So um, there's this uh, Medellin city tour called Real Tours, where you have a extended conversation with a incredibly high grade WhatsApp chatbot that gives you multiple options, asks you Like what kind of thing you fancy doing on a Tuesday night and you have a drop down menu and you say like, I want to go partying. And then it gives you like, okay, well, do you want dancing? Do you want this kind of party? And you have like, you're basically getting like real time advice from this chatbot. And this was for like a small tour guide company. And it just blew my mind that that was possible. And clearly they just had this idea, found someone on Upwork, built this thing, which to my brain, I'm like, well, this is eminently affordable. This is not a business with funding that I can't access. So if Mm. they're doing this, how do I do that? So there's a whole load of practical stuff. And also like in Colombia, there's a whole rental economy. So um, everyone has dishwashers and washing machines on the back of a motorbike and you WhatsApp the dishwasher motorbike and he brings you the dishwasher, plugs it in through your window, you put your load on and then you pay him your pesos and he drives off. No one has their own appliances. So you like part rent appliances. And that just blew my mind in terms of like, how could that change our concept of ownership and what is this weird world where we all own a car? Why are we not co-owning cars? Why are we not co-owning appliances? Like just all of that stuff I find really interesting. So there's like the practical stuff. Go on. No, I was going to say, no, no, I was going to say, yeah, keep going basically. Yeah, I was going to say other than the practical stuff. Yeah, so there's the the practical stuff. stuff. Then there's um, some uh, like work stuff in the sense of like that trip to Colombia was a pretty big moving i think the first maybe the second episode i did with you was all about my breakdown and like mental health journeys that we've kind of been on together and um it it was you know i took three weeks out of my business and i kind of framed it as a sabbatical because i felt like i needed to give it a name but it was just a long holiday way of like i'd taken my annual leave i'm director of myself so no one has to tell me how much annual leave i can take but i've taken loads so it was I want to take some more because I think I need it. And I think that this for me is part of the balancing act of running my own business and and I want to do it. Um, so that, yeah, that like the, the act of being able to do that was really powerful. And what about being immersed in another culture? We talked, I think it's, I think the, the, the two things work really well, like the mm. timeout and space. I think distract, I read, uh, this thing by Rick Rubin the other day, which is distraction is not procrastination. 
So actually, you know, long holidays and distracting yourself, whether that's going daily, like on a drive or going immersing yourself in a new country for like a long time, that is actually work. It's just, we need to get Uh our heads around that. That is work. So there's that piece, which is fascinating. And then just being in a, in a completely different culture, which I can't wait to explore where, you know, people, as you say, are nipping in with mopeds to get your dishwashers done, um, your dishes done. What out of those two things kind of colliding together, kind of the space and the difference of culture, how has that changed the way you approach brand building and marketing back in the UK? Mm. Um, I think, I think space always gives you clarity. So I am better at my job if I'm able to be more incisive and hard align with the founders I work with on like what their message really needs to be, what the stuff that they're trying to do that's just a waste of time is. Like all of my job is about creating focus. And to do that, I need to have real clarity of thought. And I think that's really difficult when you're in the grind. Um, that's not so much specifically about that cultural immersion. That's more just about like the act of being rested and having space and being able to see the wood from the trees, which I think is like a huge shift I've made. You know, I've like, I've really learned this year that my job is to make a few good recommendations and a few good decisions every week. That's actually all I need to do. And the more I try and send a thousand emails, the less good I am at those things. Um, what are the good decisions this week or in the last month just to add some context to that so I've had a founders associate start which is part of this journey of like trying to simplify my life so that I can give better decisions it's an incredibly difficult role to onboard on like I'm basically asking someone to be telepathic and when they're not telepathic I'm like you're underperforming you're not telepathic and you know what a stitch up Um, and We've had to have some really good, honest, clear communication and to get to where we're getting to, which is a really good place. But for me to do that has required like a really open mind and and the ability to actively listen and to be really empathetic and to be really clear going into those conversations of what I want. And so that's not an example of a decision, but it's definitely examples of, you know, how in a 20 minute one to one, I can have quite a profound difference on on output and I can either do that in a way that's like does have that profound difference or I can fudge it and it can just be a bit of a waste of time for everyone and and the difference between that is how well prepped and how able I am to be present in that moment that's really interesting because there's founders magic there's it's a sliding scale between founders magic and founders chaos with it when within meetings yeah. and it's like the founder can either have dr- add a little bit of sprinkle dust yeah and and it and as you say like what it it propels it makes the right decision less yeah. right decisions or the founder writers can kick in giles brooks was telling me about this founder writers love the way he says this yeah but it's like, i need to do a thousand fucking things and it just it it really demotivates the team it's like oh my god yeah I you just leave this like get, absolute yeah. whirlwind of chaos behind you it's fascinating and uh, how do you specifically like what I mean, maybe let's talk about the hardest decision you've had to make recently how do you make that decision because i think as a founder taking that taking that step back from being in the grind and that thousand details kind of thing all those thousand emails hundred emails taking a step back to make that one or two decisions that really have that kind of huge uplift mm. how do you make really hard decisions yeah So all of my really hard decisions are about people. And that's because because my business is all about people. Like I don't have a product other than my people and a Slack group. So I don't have a supply chain. I don't have much tech. Um, And because I find decisions about people particularly hard. So I don't think I am ever going to be the kind of founder who takes any conversation around pay or performance or personal development or hiring lightly hey guys thank you so much for watching this video honestly means the absolute world to me um 
I'd be so grateful for a small favor, please. It is so hard growing a YouTube channel. It is so bloody hard. Um, if you please enjoy these videos, just click the subscribe button. Um, more subscribers equals bigger guests. Bigger guests equals better conversations. And hopefully you can learn more as you build your food and drink brand. Thank you so, so much. I care deeply about other humans and I don't ever want to get to the point where my soul is so hardened that I don't take that stuff home with me. Um, so it's all people stuff and the way I do it, um, like I, I write, it's like, it's a, it's a beyond in joke. I will write a Google doc for everything. Like no decision or piece of work gets anywhere in my brain if it's not a Google doc. And that has to start with the context. So I'll always like force myself to articulate exactly what's going on. Then I'll go through the recommendations and I'll literally detail out the pros and cons. And if there's like financial work to be done, I'll do the model and I'll put the model in the doc. And those docs don't really get read by anyone else. Like that's not work that I'm doing for the sake of anyone else. That's how I make logical decisions and how I have real confidence that I've stress tested something. And um, it's also for the paper trail for my own brain. Like I have the memory of a goldfish and I think pressure uh, makes us all a bit short-sighted. So I find it incredibly helpful to be able to go into a folder and go, what the fuck was I on about? Like, why did I, why on earth did I sign off that thing? And then I go, oh, okay, because that's what you knew at that point in time. And you didn't have this like whole other bit of context that you now have. Um, and therefore you like made the best decision you could have made. So the, the answer to how I make decisions is really simple. Like I do the work. The internal work is is what yeah. you're saying is, as an yeah, but work. I like produce it as external work. I think other founders would be able to like, or other it's not founder specific thing. Other humans would be able to like walk around the park and kind of think it through. Like there has to be an output. Like I need to prove to myself I've done the work. Is let, let's let's talk about changing the name as an example of this then. Yeah, from, yeah. From Copy Club, I think this is the best example to add. Yeah, it's a kind great of- point. Yeah. Yeah, to me, me, as some meat on the bone to this, changing your name when you're, were you six or seven years in? Yeah, at least. I, I yeah, kind of lose track. The founding of it all was such a mess that like, who yeah. knows? So, a long so, old time. Yeah, long, long old time in. Talk to me about the decision. And I yeah. think I read somewhere on LinkedIn, you're like kind of paralysis, like sleepless nights, getting down to two final names, then going back, like blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I vetoed that's my a, own that's a fucking so many huge, times. That's, that's a huge decision. That's maybe one of the biggest decisions you're making. Let's talk about how you made that decision and we can talk about your process yeah. of doing the internal work but producing it like it's external work for yeah, your yeah. own self. Yeah. Um. So December twenty. 20- two years ago December a long time ago Tim who's our head of community joined the business and in like week three we sat in Leon in King's Cross and he said I think we need a new name and I was like what and he was really clear he was like there's a problem with the word copy because everyone thinks you're just for copywriters and there's a problem with the word club which is that no one knows the difference between having heard about you on LinkedIn and being an active member of the club like you don't know at which point you've become a customer. So um, there were lots of people who were like, yeah, yeah, I'm in the club. And I was like, we'd be like, cool. So you, do you go to the parties? And they're like, no, I don't know about the parties. It's like, okay, you don't know about the parties because you're not a paying subscriber and therefore you're getting a different set of comms from us and therefore you don't know about all of this stuff. So there was a, there's a, there was a product problem. Um, and I agreed with him and I sort of said like, great, let's go ahead. And so he produced the Google Doc, which is required for all internal decision making and wrote the brief and and we kind of did a bit of pushing forward on it and and then I completely lost my nerve and lost your nerve lost my nerve because there was so much evidence that copy club finally had brand awareness Mm, so yeah yeah so I had gone from years and years of like hi Dan I'm Lottie I run a business called copy club you won't have heard of us but this is what we do which is like, cool, all smiley, but exhausting, to finally getting on calls where people are like, yeah, I know what you do. And the, the, the feeling of like, okay, this is amazing, was huge. The follow-up would still be, okay, cool, so are you involved? No, I'm not. I'm, it's not for me because I'm not a copywriter. So like, okay, so I've like 
pushed one door, but then the next the next wall is just in front of me. Um, but the brand awareness just felt so like incredibly compelling. And the and the the name Copy Club, albeit a name I made up in four minutes, was about copying people in different categories. It was never anything to do with copywriting. And there was this meaning in it that I still really liked. Like I do still really believe in the power of copying with pride. Um and so we did all of this like copywriting stuff around copycats and how we were going to lean into loads of cat metaphors. I don't know where I thought that was going to go with, but like <laughs> loads, right, loads of decks about how we we're going to have loads of cat icons. And then I was just like, I can't, I can't be talking about that credibly. Um, and it just kept, it just like kept resurfacing, and and we kept talking about where we want to get to, which is you know internally we talk about a goal of having ten thousand members globally who have created this like secret weapon for startup marketers where we've all got this like incredible level of connection that means we're just disproportionately better at our jobs there was no way i was going to get to ten thousand members if everyone thought we were for copywriters so it just kept resurfacing as this like insurmountable problem and all of the other strategic problems just came after it was like there's no point in thinking about um whether our pricing structure is right because everyone thinks we're just for copywriters like every decision was like Oh, but there's this massive elephant in the room. So it just became clear that we had to change the elephant in the room. Um, and the, you know, and then this there was many a document on the pros and the cons and the and the existential questions. You know, do I really want that vision? Do I want the hard work? Am I prepared to take what's going to be probably a difficult eighteen months until we've rebuilt brand awareness and new name? Am I okay with that, or actually, do I just want a small happy business where everyone knows what I'm talking about and I can like go to events and not have to explain myself? So there's a lot of documents in that process. Um, and what does the document look like? And then, and then what does it? So you, you say it's you're, literally so got, context, bullet points. So context, you, you're right. We need to change the name because no, the context uh, will be: this is our goal. We're committed to this goal. Um, yeah. We've got good brand awareness. Um, there's this recurring trial barrier around whatever. It's like all of the stuff that's informing this. And then there'll be an objective, which is like the objective in this doc is to decide whether we're going to carry on with a work stream about changing the name or not. And then it will be, here are our options. Yes, we should change the name. No, we should leave it another year and see what happens, whatever. And then under each of those options, I'll be like, what's the pros? What's the cons? What's the potential opportunity cost? And then like, what would I always ask myself, like, how would I know if this has worked? So like, what what would be true you know there's like different language for it depending on the situation but say i was going to leave it another year like what would i be looking for in a year to feel differently about this decision which is my point around the value of having this archive because you go back in and you're like like you have you have a paper trail you have to be held accountable to your own like historic commitments and it allows you to kind of sleep at night as well if it's like out your brain and it's exactly. in this, it's like in it's, this... it's like um gratitude journaling for dweebs well, for decision making, which is which yeah. is mad. Like I've got like so obviously I I know you write loads and I write loads. I have the same form, although it's just fucking chaotic. But on well, it started as on Evernote and Notion. But any big decision or negotiation I've ever had to do, I'll write down. Yeah. But there's no like start like it's just chunder. <laughs> and I'll and I sort of see but, where see where exactly. the blind spots are. It's a process. That, that'll of be really actively helpful. doing the work. Yeah, actively doing the work. And then what advice would you give people who are struggling with really hard decisions? Like, I didn't think we were going to go here, but I just think it's val super valuable. Like, um, what is well, the, I, would, the I am very here for the advice because I do not think I'm good at decision making. And it's like a muscle that I'm really trying to train. And How? I am practice, um, practice and a bit of self-care to be like, some of this is going to go wrong. But I'm definitely... Yeah. I'm definitely not proud at the moment as a leader of how much I have to rely on my leadership team for support with decision making. I I think I think the business needs me to be a bit a bit more clear. One of the really nice things about my document structure is that it's always inherently collaborative because no one like everyone will know why I've made a decision and I'll share my documents quite readily. So I'll, put, I'll basically pull out my working and say, here's where I've got to and why. And James may say, I don't agree with you. And I've got this extra point of view, which will change my thinking. Or he'll say, like, I've, I've read through it and I get it. So I don't, I don't feel like I'm ever making dictatorial choices because I'm like bringing the team on the journey a lot. Um, 
which in this in the case of writing and like changing the name was hugely important. Like it wasn't just for me to walk around the park and decide I was changing the name or decide what the new name was going to be. I had to like get my team to co-create this decision. But what's and have really a real shrewd, sense of pride. What's really shrewd about doing it on a on a document, on a piece of paper, albeit online, is that one, you can write your decision without anyone else in the room. Yeah. So it means that you're not going into decision by committee when, yeah. you know, you're going around, around a fucking circles, but I should do this. Everyone wants to chip in. There's loads of ego. So that's amazing. Two, the employees get to read it in their own time or the senior leadership team yeah. gets to read it in, the time, in their own time and digest it and then add their notes. So they still feel they're involved. Three, in these decision by committee meetings that I've sometimes, you know, sat in is that people with ego kick in. Mm. And they they kind of take over the conversation. So when a decision should be made by five people, the loudest ego wins. So, yeah. you know, sort of two people make most of the imp- impact of the decision the most. Whereas if we put it on this Google Doc, everyone, the, the introvert may have the most in- interesting insight. And that can go on on this Google Doc. And then everyone knows why. I think it's really, really, really clever. As I said, didn't expect it to go so deep into this, but I think it's, it's fascinating. What were some of the other names that didn't make the cut? <laughs> Like what were the ones where you were like? Oh, there was some really, there were some really funny ones. Go um, on. Well, when we were in the like, we so we did a partnership with an agency called Frontier, who were brilliant and were real like, real sounding boards. Like it was a proper partnership. So they were doing the rebrand. Sorry. So they what did was... the yeah they did the thing. They helped us with the strategy behind the rebrand because Tim and right. I basically just realised that. Which is the irony of this is that I do this work for other brands. And I just had to completely admit defeat because it was like rebranding my own face. Like I was so close to it yes. that I just could not even begin to fathom a different world. Um, and the point, I, I, ironically, I actually did like the 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 name, what, like ironically, a lot of the thinking was mine. And I say that with no ego, but just because like I was thinking about this all the time. So I was coming up with this stuff, but I still couldn't have decided it was right without this external expertise to like help me validate it and almost like provide me a hundred other options so that I had real confidence in my own. Um, so they were really helpful. They, um, in one hilarious meeting, proposed that we were called Boost Jam, which was like the internal <laughs> project. The project became like the internal project. It became called Project Boost Jam um, for a long time. Um, that was just some, that was just some really weird stuff, but that's part of the process. And then I was in a, I was at a founder's retreat in a queue for the bar, chatting to a mate of mine about what I wanted to do and that I was changing the name. And she said, well, tell me about what, like, tell me why the business exists. And I said that it was, for me, it was all about helping people move up in their careers and that that was like practical and emotional. And it was like about that feeling of rising and doing that together. And she was like, so it's like up club. And I was like, yeah, but it's, I mean, literally this was the conversation but the club is part of it, but there's this like worlds of expertise that we offer, which is more than just the club. And she was like, so it's up world. I was like, yeah, cool. Who was like, your mate and what I was go. the festival? Uh, she's called Ashley. She runs an amazing business called More Happy, um, which is coaching. It's, it's incredible. It's coaching made accessible because they use coaches who are qualifying. So right. it's 40, I think it's now 40 pounds a month per employee for unlimited coaching. And the coaches are training, so they're doing their free hours before they qualify, which is how it can be like a totally different cost. And actually, to your question earlier, how do you make hard decisions? Coaching is incredible for that. And I think More Happy is a great resource because you can just book an hour in someone's diary and they will be a sounding board for you for an hour to help you through that thinking. And where was the festival? Um, I'm part of a community called Founders and it was in South Wales. Is that the do lectures? It's very near the do lectures, which I also went to this year. It's been a year. Of, I've been very busy drinking beers in fields. It's really hard life. <laughs> um, you've got your own festival as well, which we will we'll come on to. Yes. Uh, so no, talk to me about talk to me about talk to me about do le- the do lectures. Um, David's been on this podcast. Yeah. A super inspiring guy. Yeah, yeah. What did you learn about yourself? Good. Lottie going in to do 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 festival, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, do lectures. Well, do lectures. Fucking out. Yeah. Late, 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 late. Last, late. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lottie coming out. How how did you change? Or what did you learn? Yeah. Um, I learned. <laughs> I learned that I don't like lectures. 
So <laughs> I love, I know this about myself. I don't know why I had to go to a, a thing called the Do Lectures to learn and lectures. I love um, meeting new people. I love um, having space outside of London and away from my laptops that create connection. And I'm inherently social and I get loads of energy from other people. Love all of that. Do not love sitting in a barn for long days listening to lectures. And I and I knew this. I've, I hated the university, but it was just this funny moment on like 10 a.m. of day one where I was like, ha, huh, so the do lectures are all lectures. Right. Uh, so, yeah, that I think is just a, I think it's just okay to know what you don't like. And I really, took, I really took that away from that and then actually shaped the weekend based on that. So had a really incredible time basically not going to many of the lectures and spending an awful lot of time catching the people on the hay bales who'd also decided to like take some time out and reflect or finding someone to go for a walk with. Like I just get all the value from the conversations around those key events. And I find that at any, like I really am not big on those big conferences or any of that stuff. I find it all like the keynote speech vibe. I just is not the way I learn. Hey guys, absolutely pausing um, that Mackenzie Jones are extending their partnership with Hungry. So gassed. Um, in case you have been living under a rock, who are Mackenzie Jones? They are FMCG recruitment specialists. They work with some amazing brands, Lucky Saint, Real Superfoods, Hunter and Gather, and Purdy and Fig. Also with some of the big puppers, the big boys, the big G's, PepsiCo, Unilever, Campari. I've known Billy for yonks, Paul for last year. He's a top bro. They're just super kind and lovely. And they're just dedicated to our wonderful space, our wonderful industry of buccaneering challenger brands. And that they're so much more than a recruitment business. Check out the podcast with them. It's epic. Um, I've even, even introduced Mackenzie Jones to some amazing brands and they've really helped them scale. If you're looking to hire, just reach out to them, have a chinware, get in touch, do yourself a favor. Thank you. Guys, are you ready? There is going to be some absolutely, totally, brilliantly bonkers next level madness coming your way today. Are you ready to take your brand to a whole new stratosphere for free? Imagine connecting your product to a digital world through a simple smartphone scan. You know the drill, scan it, bish bash bosh, you're away. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the magic of the new GS1 powered QR codes. These next generation barcodes act as a gateway to a world of endless possibilities. They connect your product's unique identity to multiple online sources of enriched real-time content. Why? Why on planet Earth should you be getting your mitts on these GS1 powered QR codes? Well, look, very, very simple, mate. GS1 will help you drive revenue, upsell and cross-sell your amazing products, boost your bottom line, boost your bottom line. Mm, yes, please. Where do I sign? Enhance customer engagement. Look, delight your customers with dynamic content that captivates and keeps them coming back for more, more, more. Please, sir, uh, can I have some more? Yes, you can. Comply with regulations. Look. You want to be building your brand. You don't want to be knee deep wading through a deep river of legislation aggravation. These barcodes allow you to stay ahead of the curve. Look, don't allow this beautiful boat of boundless opportunity to sail away into the molting sunset. Be on that boat. Join GS1 UK's free pilot program today. Yes, it's completely free. There will be a link in the show notes. Thank you so much. There's a less a delicious lesson that in brand building is like you can have the main thing, but actually a lot of the the magic is all around the outside. It's the little yeah. mo- touch points. Whether that's literally like a, a lucky saint <laughs> can, like I don't know, why I've got one here, but like the the <laughs> here's the, what I made earlier. Yeah, here's what I made earlier. The, the 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 lucky saint is the main logo, but the the little ladybird they've got there is like a little thing, but it just adds those moments of magic. And I think what you're saying is at do lectures not the lectures but the actual the moments in between the magic in between the moments the moments in between the moments yeah and there's a huge thing around community building and how you build communities around brands which is like facilitating space is different to delivering content what's the difference so you're literally lottie's t- teaming up perfectly today it's like i don't <laughs> even have an interview you're just everywhere everyone i just like to go you're stuff. just like yeah yeah um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, <laughs> what is an example okay pure sport have a run club i'm obsessed with the pure sport run club at the moment where pure they, sport pure sport cbd socks i don't even know what they sell the point is cool, i don't cool. know what they sell but i know about their brand and i have an emotional connection to their brand where i actually couldn't even tell you what the product are. i know they have socks because in their tiktok there's a lot of reference to socks so um 
pure sport, have a run club, loads of people get together often. Sorry, my Google calendar is going wild. Um, get together to go running and they like have this huge, rich sense of community from, from that. Um, they are not just producing ed- educational content about running. And like in a really simple sense, what they're doing is creating space by saying like, let's just turn up and go for a run and therefore connections between their members, between their customers and turning them into community members as opposed to delivering stuff from the stage. And the do lectures understands that in that like the programming is, yes, there are the lectures in the day, but David knows that those are, those are like only one part of our emotional experience. It's like the band that's after supper and it's the choir that's singing while you have drinks and it's like beautiful flowers on the table at breakfast. It's all of those bits. Plus the fact that you're just guaranteed to be sitting next to someone amazing. Mm. That makes it so great. So I want to talk about community building from mm. a brand perspective. Um, and actually the guys I interviewed yesterday are my good pals, local, local beer. Mm. Really interesting category because it's the, the brand's called Local, like L-O-Cal. So, mm. so it works on two fronts. It's basically like um, lo- low-calorie beer, low-AVB beer as well. Yeah. Um, they... That they work that the local works on two fronts. It's a bit of a play on words. Obviously, like local in terms of the low calories, they make it with local breweries, but they they want to build a community around the brand. They think they've got the guy who was a designer for AB and Bev did work like the branding looks amazing, looks absolutely gorgeous. But they want to think how do we build this moat in this community? Mm. Um, and what they were talking about and what we were teasing out last night is, okay, what beer brand, uh, those are healthy beer brands of like Lucky Saint, which they're doing a great job. Um, there's a few others are trying to own the run club, a kind of occasion. Mm. So they'll sponsor run, run clubs, which is great, but like mm. local don't want to be that. Mm. And what we kind of came up with, and this is, this may not even come to fruition, but I think it's just a good lens to explore this with how to build communities as brands is they were like, well, why don't we support, um, Comedy clubs. Mm. James used to work in comedy. Mm. No one's. Re- there's no real beer brand to own comedy. There's obviously we could do local comedy nights. We could get a big uh, comedian on board. The whole pushing the benefits instead right. of because they don't want to be like a worthy low calorie beer because I don't think people in the UK are really going to make that switch because if, mm. if it's you know it's such a boozy sort of like blokey industry beer t- traditionally they want to kind of target more of the female audience one but two the way they think they get the lever they're going to pull is like drinkers not for low calories drinkers to get less binned obviously that's not the tagline but like mm. in, a, in a comedy club it's like well you you'll actually enjoy the jokes you remember the jokes like and I, what we were talking about yesterday is you know my brother went to a gig and got smashed and he couldn't remember it anyway that's just to give you some context <laughs> i'd love to go what some of the questions they've asked me to kind of ask you is how to actually go about building a community. And I suppose the first question is how to know where to go with the community. Do, do you start with, right, we're going to own comedy clubs or mm. comedy, um, or we're going to do running, or we're going to, or is it okay to do, try five, six, seven things? Do you, like right at that beginning of a brand when you're like, yeah. you've got 10 stockists, how do you do this? Okay, so the first thing is that you need to get very clear on the, I get so grumpy about this, but like the definition of community and owning a community. So yeah. grassroots comedy is an existing community. You're not creating a community, you are sponsoring one you are like attaching your brand to an existing community and you can pay to have the right to do that and you should do that. And that's a, um, that's like a marketing strategy that makes a lot of sense. That's slightly different to uh, like two other routes. So the other route is that they say we want to create, we want to genuinely create our own community. We don't want to take part in someone else's community. We want our own. To do that, you need to focus single-mindedly on what you are giving your members that they're going to connect about that has nothing to do with you. So a community is a self-organizing beast. An audience Mm. is you saying, come and watch my comedy show. The community only exists if the brand is able to disappear. So I'm really proud that if I stopped organizing, if my team disappeared from Upworld, Upworld would continue without us. People would carry on asking questions and carry on offering to support each other and carry on giving talks. 
that would continue. And that to me is a huge source of pride. And so if you want to do that, you need to start with what is what is your audience, what do your audience need to connect around? And how can you facilitate those connections? And the answer is not a specific low calorie beer. The answer might be they want to talk, they want to connect around comedy in the morning because they want to like rethink about this, in which case you start doing like breakfast, you start hosting breakfast comedy sessions and you give them the option to do it. And then you say to them like, go organize your own. Like this isn't our thing. This is your thing. Like we're building a community. It's like you can't control a neighborhood. The neighborhood is its own beast. The mayor like facilitates and looks after that, but he doesn't, he doesn't orchestrate it. it. It lives on its own. What's the other route? Well, the gap in the middle is kind of the pure sports run club thing where you create like branded vehicles. So you could do a whole load of low-cal comedy shows and you could put them on. So you're not sponsoring someone else's comedy show. You're organizing your own. And you're, created like, you're creating like a branded property that is sort of creating community, but there's no, there's no vision that if you didn't exist, it would live on. And could you try, try all, because I think what you said there right at the beginning about, you know, being really clear on what type of community it is. Could you try, sorry for sounding dumb here, could you try all three or do all three amalgamate into one? So could you do like a breakfast for um, your diehard fans who love comedy yeah. in Hampstead Heath in the morning? Yeah, and of course you could. In the evening, sponsor Hampstead Heath's, or Hampstead, not Hampstead Heath, <laughs> uh, Hampstead Heath's, uh, Hampstead's. <laughs> comedy event like as in yeah. do, do, they, do they they amalgamate and yeah they do inside? they do but if i come back to what i was saying about like holidays giving yeah. you clarity my like holidayed clarity brain would say yeah. what are you actually trying to achieve and therefore let's do the stuff that's going to help you achieve that quite specifically so if what they're trying to achieve is brand awareness within a really tight target market you're probably better off just going and sponsoring a load of existing comedy stuff. That's probably the cheapest, fastest way of getting reach and, and testing affinity. Like that would give you quite a clear sense of, okay, we've done this for six months. How do you test affinity? Sorry. Um, really good question. You, it would depend on how you were setting it up. So you, know, you, could just, you could just survey numbers. You could be like, right, we're going to do, for six months, we're going to sponsor an event every month at this pub. And then after the last pub, the last of the six months, we're going to stand outside with clipboards saying, like, are you going to buy this brand? We could start flyering after the events and see if it converts to sales or even to traction or interest. Like, are those people going on to do something or think something about the brand? So fascinating. Because I, I think you're right. There's a massive difference between audience and community. Yeah. And, and actually the role, and there's no right or wrong. And this is what I say, we were talking about yesterday. There's no right or wrong to brand building. Um, no, you know, but like, I go, oh, like, yeah, you just got to know why. So I run a course called the Startup Marketing Accelerator, which is to help like heads of marketing get ready for, well, like senior marketing managers get ready for heads of roles. And all of it is just me wanging on about why you're doing everything. What is the specific brand challenge you're trying to solve? So are you trying to build brand awareness? Are you trying to change brand perception? So is it that loads of people have heard of your brand, but they think that you're not relevant to them or that you're just for lager lads or like whatever the problem is? And then or, or is it that you need to find a really cost-effective acquisition channel and therefore you've got to get something that people talk about and actually you want to like invest in a small audience, but what's really important to you is that that audience go on and tell other people because that's what's in your commercial model. It's all about the why. And then the, this is just such an interesting metaphor because it's like, okay, the brief is to get low cal into comedy clubs. There are 50 different ways you could do that, all of which would have a slightly different outcome. And the question of which is the right one is only answered by really understanding what the point of it in the first place is. Bohemi, our beloved sponsor, are helping build the fastest growing challenger food and drink brands. Look, if you're a small brand just starting out and need your first indie stockist, your first hundred stockists to wholesale, Bohemi are the platform to categorically speed that up. But if you're a big brand wanting to get bigger, Bohemi are also insane. They make field sales marble smooth, silky slick. They're just epic. Ollie's, Ollie's been on this podcast twice, actually. They saw a 29% uplift in sales when using Bohemi to check major malt listings availability. Insane. 29% uplift by downloading an app. Insane. Lucky Saint, my boy Aaron Duff, who's coming on this podcast in a couple of weeks, 
weeks. He uses it to manage a team of 30 people. And they've, like you said, have unlocked 500 draft listings by using Bowie Look, you've got to get involved with this stuff. It's absolutely insane. And it will categorically change your life. It's just the sickest platform. I use it all the time at Islands. Hi guys, super, super quick one. So, so excited. Look, for years I've been badgering on about Hungry the podcast. You're probably bored to death. Thanks for putting up with me. But Hungry is also an agency. And we look after one amazing brand called Islands Chocolate. We've had a great time over the year. We've won listings at a load of wholesalers. We've won Milk and More. We've got our first grocery listing coming very soon, which is very, very sick. But what I'm thrilled to announce is Hungry is merging with HC Consulting. Um, my boy Harry Clark and his wonderful team, he's an absolute G. They do brand strategy, new business, business and account management. But why I really love working with Harry and why we've got on so well over the last couple of months is Harry was actually the founder of uh, the boozy isolated brand Pops. So he's been in the trenches, he's grafted his face off, he's had the sleepless nights, he's had the turmoil, he's had the triumph, he knows what it is to be a founder, he is a founder. And he's got a proven track record in grocery and out of home. Holy moly dips, the gut stuff, Savile drinks, Remio gelato. So if you're a brand and you're, you're stuck, you're looking for like new business help, you're looking to scale, drop us a message. We'd love to chat. Thank you so much. Back to the old episode. This is a massive generalization. So like just to just set, set the tone there. But in, in brands going from zero to one million retail sales, what yeah. do you think that the why should be? Should it be brand awareness? Should it be um, perception? Should it be community? Yeah. Um, it depends on the route to market, but assuming that you want to be a retail brand. Yep. Until you have physical distribution, that is meaningful. And therefore, like, it is easy for me to find you. There is fuck all point in brand awareness. Because there's, I can't, I could be fully aware, but what am I going to do with that awareness other than like march around London looking for this beer? Or like maybe if I die hard buy it online, but that's a pretty niche. Like I think that's limited to like relatives, investors, and people in the industry. And then like obsessives. I think it's quite hard at that early stage to get people, like a definitely category obsessives, but you've got to have a really clear, you've got to have a really good reason to buy something specific on the internet. Um, so if you want to be retail, it's all about distribution. If you want distribution, you need to win over one person, which is the buyer. And therefore you're writing, everything you're doing is about how you get on that buyer's radar and how you present them something that feels really differentiated. So if you want a really sexy slide that says, we're going to grow awareness of this brand by scaling our amazing work with grassroots comedy. Great. Sponsor one event. Get your mate who runs a pub to let you do it. Don't pay them anything. Take 500 photos from 10 different angles and imply that you're doing this nationwide sponsorship campaign. Don't actually do it until you've got the distribution. And then spend the money instead on taking the buyer to a comedy show. Like, so, so, yeah, yeah. It's, it, yeah it's, it's, it goes back to why, why are you doing this on what stage? What they actually do, they've just gone into the, into the co-op soup. You're like this. Nice. They, um, they, they called up the buyer in the part of the call and co-op are based up in Manchester. Yeah. And they're like, oh, what's your local boozer you go to afterwards? Like, we're going to need to have a pint. It's going to be a long day. End of the pitch. They go, oh, by the way, we've brought our local to your local. And they had two massive kegs. They had it on tap and they got all the buyers there. I mean, it's, it's, it's they're, they're, they're really incredible. crazy. That's yeah, really clever, but it's but that that almost is because yeah. I was with them last night having dinner in um near you at near your what you're actually like Jolene place. I don't know if you've ever been to oh, Jolene. Yeah. Really good, yeah. Where's my invite, and, Dan? You're down the road. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they were they were talking about this like oh which what do we do? And and it's going back one step. Do you think in terms of this decision making, the paralysis yeah. they're having is not nowhere near to the ninth degree of you having to change your name but they're like okay should we do comedy or should we do um should we put our um marker down on on health should we put our marker down on gyms um marker down on smoke support of different things in that early stage how does that work do you throw stuff on the wall do you yeah it's really it's really hard question um I'm doing some consulting for a business at the moment that's got no idea of its target customer, no idea of its brand identity, and no idea of what the category is going to be. And so I'm just like basically just going around cerebral loops in my head, driving myself insane. And it, this feels a bit like that. I think there's definitely a filter of, okay, what is the role that this product is going to play in someone's life? 
um, in this case, is going to is going to uh, replace a existing beer consumption moment or an, or a consumption occasion that's like connected to beer. So I'd quite quickly be like, I don't think gyms like the gym and then going straight for a pint thing isn't that isn't really a thing. It's like an it's like an edge case as opposed to like oh everyone goes for a pint after their workout. In which case I'm like eliminate that health feels like a red herring and then you almost get to like a you have this Venn diagram of what are the occasions that make sense for our product and then what what are the things that we want to be known for as a brand and that comes from like founders authentic identity or their sense of what the insight is they're building this business on and then that would get you to a bit of a short list and I think comedy is a really interesting one because like I am literally going to Bethel Green comedy club tonight and I'm not drinking and it's like that is a genuine problem and I think the comedy industry, like the, you know, every every comic every comic who's given up booze, to my frustration, just does a set about how they've given up booze because the fact that you're not drinking in that industry is funny. Mm. That's not a joke. That's that's like not food for thought. So I think that's your process. And there's probably others. It's probably like darts. <laughs> you know, like what, where where are these untapped boozy occasions with no no alcohol free bit is owning. It's like rooting itself in that subculture. Yeah, really, really smart. And then, and, and I always believe there's 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 dormant categories, yeah. like dormant categories and dormant kind of communities or cultures to tap in. Dormant categories. Yes. The obvious one is like is oat milk, the old dairy oat milks. Like that was the, the crusty, shitty section of a you know exactly. Uh, and now that's kicked off. It's gone yeah. huge. Tin uh, tuna. Loads, that's the one I'm obsessed with. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep wanting yeah, to quit my job and start a fancy tuna brand. Like John West, there's, there's a com- sleeping giants here. There's a company called Sea Sisters who are based near you, actually. Un- he was a chef at St. John. Un- oh. re- I basically premiumized the packaging. looks gorgeous. Yeah. Um, which is, they do tin fish. It's a challenger brand of tin fish. Oh my God. Um, I'll, okay, I'll, I need to, can, you, can you hook me up? I've I'll, honestly been obsessed with the fish category. Also, like, yeah, you'll be able to get it. You'll be, get, be able to get it around you because their base is in some, is in some way. Love that. Um, da, 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 da. I'm banning the word better in any marketing content I approve. Better yeah. than what? Better why? Better says who? Yeah, Why it's are you lazy. banning the word better? What's wrong with the word better? Just tell me why. Just, I just think it's shit. I think it's not. I think, okay, there are, there, I'm trying to think whether there are exceptions to this. If you, if you know that your cus- consumer really believes that there is an inherent problem in the category and they are actively disgruntled then better might work but most of the time we don't know that what we're experiencing is substandard we need to be shown that there's a better way that we couldn't imagine so to your point on oat milk no one was going into oat milk thinking well this is a substandard oat milk experience they were just buying the crusty oat milk. And then someone comes along and says, look, we've raised the bar in oat milk. This is what oat milk could have been for you. And that suddenly feels really exciting. But the proposition there isn't just we're better. It's this is what makes us good. And what makes us good needs to be presented in the context of what's bad. So we're working for a condom and lube brand at the moment called Rome. Fascinating. They make high-end lube. Category dominated by Durex and own label. Um, Rome is about twice the price on shelf. Beautiful packaging. In theory, a better product. And the the like the incoming hypothesis was was just better than Durex. And of course, you want better and you want organic because it's like deeply intimate and you wouldn't put loads of like PVA glue on your face. So why are you using it when you're having sex it's like when you put it like that kind of get it but mm. but you but you can't just go into that category and say this is better because no one is actively dis, dissatisfied with the status quo they need to be explained that there is a new promised land they need to be explained as a new promised land so how how tell me why it's good 
it's good because it's made from all natural ingredients that are sourced from stuff that you would cook with uh, and tell me that Durex is bad versus my competition, which is made of a whole load of e-numbers and stuff that you'd never put on your skin. Um, tell me it's good. It's like longer lasting than it's natural wetness. Like what are the, what are the things that someone cares about in that category and prove to me that it delivers against those? Don't just tell me it's better and ask me to work out why. Oh my God. I am so, so, so excited. It feels like Hungary is finally swimming in the big leagues. I can't even believe this. It's absolutely mental, but delighted to announce that Big Fish, yes, Big Fish are part of the podcast. Perry's been on the podcast three times. Listeners absolutely love it. Some of my most downloaded and cherished episodes of all time. But Big Fish are behind literally so many brands in your cupboard, in your weekly shop. Charlie Bigham, Year Valley, Tyrrells, Clipper Tea, Goo, Rana. I mean, make the list is longer than the River Nile. But they also share risk and invest in brands that they really believe are a force for good. They're brands that they believe are going to be the next big thing. Like Howder, the snack that gives back. But even more exciting news, Big Fish want to speak to the next wave of small challenger food and drink brands that are destined for big things. The raconteurs, the movers, shakers, buccaneering visionaries. So look, if you want to speak to Big Fish and just have a chat, get your brand in front of them, then drop me a message. My mate Louis from Local Beer, amazing beer, was in their office, aka La Fish Bowl, uh, last week chatting to Perry, Freddie and the Big Fish crew. So drop me a message if you would like to speak to them. I've got a thing of like the market doesn't reward better, it rewards different because every, every, every man and his dog says we're better. We go to the buyer saying we've got, we're better, give us more distribution. We've got a better taste. We've got a better boom, 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 boom. And actually I think if you're different is, is the new promised land. We're just, we're singing off the same hymn sheet, maybe just different kind of tones and volumes, but it's the same thing in terms of when, when you're different, you just, you just cut through straight away. Um, yeah, and, and a way was... to be different is to be meaningfully better. So you can be better, but make it meaningful and substantiate it. It's the language. What do you mean by meaningful? As in like, I am significantly, I'm going to last five times longer. I am three times more sustainable. I am made of this versus this brand that's made of, you know, I'm made of X and this brand's made of Y. That's, that, is, that is telling me that you're better, but proving it as you do so. What really gets me is like the word better used in copy. Because it's just like, either it suggests like a real lack of faith in the product because the marketing team have been like, please explain to us why it's actually better. And everyone's been like, I can't. <laughs> and so they've just gone yeah, to print. Yeah. It's like, they've gone to print with that. Or it's just like, it's just like a lack of interrogation and a lack of understanding, a lack of insight into like, what is the, what is, what are the perceived problems in the category and what do people want? From what brands are really exciting you? at the minute, like underrated brands that you think are going to do big things? I actually really got a lot of time for Islands, which is the brand we have in common. I think what they are doing... So, they're currently B2B, predominantly. Tiny bit of retail, tiny bit of e-commerce. I think that brand has the potential to be an absolute beast online. I think if they take their meaningfully better proposition which is we are chef's preferred chocolate we are that good and we can prove it to you because here is here is our history which is like we've been a we've been a cooking chocolate for a very long time and they can translate that into being like we're a chocolate gifting brand that is um that is not like better than hotel chocolat but is meaningfully better is like has a completely different origin story i think that's huge so i think that brand is really exciting because it's it's not even scratching the surface of what it can become but we we, we were both involved in the rebrand from different mm. angles obviously kind of l's the link in between all of this but yeah. the the word in terms of that new promised land piece the word chef is is the new promised land yeah is you know we're like we're better chocolate better chocolate i look, looked at the original decks we were doing for retail it's like better but i know i was part of this problem but better mm. best better reframe chef's chocolate suddenly it's Great British baking, great British, oh God, great British venue, great British bake off. Get, always get those two confused. That is kicking off like huge. Why the category's so far behind? If you look at mm. if you look at the category, there's like ten fucking flowers, mm. um, bags of flour. So I think the chefs, the reframe of chefs is a new promised land. I think in terms of, I get excited because I I go. Have, we, have you tried the pity fours they do? You know, no. all, oh my days. Oh. So I've. I've I've been badgering Wilf about this, saying, mate, we need to get these into retail because yeah. 
everyone gets buys chocolate after a, you know for a, yeah. uh, do a dinner party. We sell them into the Michelin star restaurants in London. Like go to Heston at the end if you yeah. get a little chocolate with your coffee. That's ours. That's oh. Ireland's. But I'm like, no, like every, the, if you go down that aisle in Waitrose, it's that good, um, not good diet, yeah, Godiva or that Gillian, you yeah. know, Gillian, yeah, like, yeah, 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 the shells. It looks, it's a weird brand, but anyway, I'm like, that is <laughs> ripe, for, right? That, that is <laughs> ripe. That's so for, true. That's one of those brands that, like, as soon as you in- mentally engage brain with, you're like, they're weird, fat, squashy shells. Yeah, what? with white. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember, I remember going to like a, a school trip to Belgium. And getting like bare chocolate and like you know, sort of <laughs> got scoffing my face on the on the bus. But I think yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think um, the other bit, which for for to help I suppose listeners is, is with the new promised land piece, is make it really clear if if you're going to say the new promised land is chef's chocolate, make sure that like the journey is really clear on how you get there. And by this, I mean like the, the, the packaging or the vehicle to get there is, is really clear, which is the packaging. So we've gone from packaging that looked like coffee, really super all over the shop to tins, super premium and gives you the ability to go, to go online. I think yeah. that's, yeah. And you guys have been instrumental in that. So thank you. But I, yeah, I um, just think if, get, if we've got the positioning right and we've got, baby steps into one out of three channels what you so copy club are sorry not copy club i'm fucking now sorry no no, no <laughs> don't worry <laughs> up world the brand formerly known yeah. as copy club yeah okay well let's let, let's go back to that actually because yeah. we didn't we we almost um we ended up going to decision making which was super valuable copy clubs ingrained in me i've just mm. said it there F- faux pas apologies no no what it's in me biggest, too biggest hurdles uh, unforeseen challenges with the name change in the last six months or whenever it went Such alive. an interesting question, like today. So, uh, changed the name, had obviously written all the docs on what's going to, what, how am I going to know if this is a success, a success in a year, had not written a doc on how am I going to know in a month if this has been a good idea. So there's this weird period where I just had no, Sorry, like, you've nothing written to hang myself on. So I'd, I'd ri- said- in 12 months time, we'll know yep. that this has been a good plan because a conversion rate will be higher. We'll have less conversations where we're told we're just for copywriters. Okay, okay. You know, blah, blah, blah. I'd got you, clear on you. that. But I hadn't said to myself, 30 days in, what what needs to be true for this to feel positive? So there was this weird summer where I was just like, I think it's fine because no one's told me it's not fine. But is that enough to make it fine? Like, how do you know? Um, I thought it had been really plain sailing. We just done yesterday and today a sort of feedback campaign. I've never done anything like this. So I posted on LinkedIn yesterday saying, I want help. I want you to tell me what's bad about my business. I think there's good awareness of Upworld, formerly Copy Club, but I think loads of people aren't joining and I don't know why. And I want to know why. This is inspired by a chat I had with someone at a drinks party on Tuesday where they were just kind enough. An old friend of mine was kind enough to say, Loads of people talk about it all the time. These are what I think the barriers are. It's just that that like really amazing thing where like, the kindest the kindest thing to do is to actually give someone the feedback and people just don't do it. They just it's just so much easier to be like, you guys are amazing. It's like great. Firstly, I don't thoroughly believe you. Secondly, it just means so much more if you take the time to articulate what we could be doing better. So inspired by this, I was like, well, wonder what else people on the internet are thinking. So I'm just going to ask them. So I did that and then did a. LinkedIn, I uh, sorry, and then sent an email to all of our non-members this morning saying, again, I want your feedback. Here's a type form. Call me, write to me and tell me what we can be doing better. And then I'm going to be slacking every single one of our members with the same question over the next week. So it's like a big old campaign. <laughs> like we are getting a lot of data. We've probably got like 60 data points already. And they're like rich, like long form prose from people in our world telling us what they think. And um is still pretty confusing. Like the reality is a lot of people are like, up world, up club, copy club, like what the fuck is going on? Like, that is fair. (laughs) I hear you. And I think it's just going to take time. I think I was lulled into a false sense of security that it was like, I just all gone really well and that there was no implications to it. And I think we've now got to live through a period of confusion where there's just like 
a bit less engagement in what we do because everyone's a bit confused. And then I think everyone will forget the copy club is ever a thing and we'll be up world forever more. Mm. Um, but yeah, which feels like we're pre- in this purgatory. Pre- yeah, I appreciate the honesty as well. The the when you said there's so there's I understand there's upworld and brand hackers, they're two different things. Did you say mm. there's an up club as well, or is that part of the confusion? Well, this is part of the confusion. So Upworld is our newsletter, is our recruitment business, is our courses. There is then a product called Up Club that you pay a subscription to be part of. Right. But that 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 architecture isn't isn't clicking. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we've got to work out how to resolve that tension. Yeah. And what I know it's you've literally just sent this out yesterday, but what what's your kind of your gut feel about how you go well, about doing that? Honestly, not the foggiest, and I'm a bit like baffled by it. I'm trying to do really good best practice and like not go into panic mode, get the data, like codify the data and be like, what are the recurring themes? And then like solve the themes in order. Um, it's obviously really hard to do when you're like pouring through these emails. Like it's really hard not to go into action mode. Um, I don't know. I know that it's the right decision. Like I know that the re and this is why, because I wrote so many documents, I thought so deeply about it. I stand by the decision to change the name. I know why I did it. I am comfortable with the idea that there will be a purgatory period until it makes sense. So some of it may just be a waiting game. It might just be, I just need to explain this 100 times until one, I get the pattern right, two, we get the copyright, and three, it's just become like we just built awareness of our new name. Um, but then I think we'll probably have to do, like we probably just need to review our communication and think think again about how we do it. I, don't, I actually don't think anything will change from this. I think we'll just tighten how we talk about ourselves. Well, I like because what you, 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 you said, I know, I know, I know. And I think Ew. for people who we kind of go back to the beginning, we were talking about people who are struggling with making decisions is this internal however you manifest it whether it's journaling or a document external document for internal purposes <laughs> that gives you the the, the the courage of your convictions or convictions yeah. you know what i mean and i think that's that's the hardest thing because a lot of people not a lot of people but, uh, but with me I, if i was in your situation i'd probably be panicking do you know what i mean as yeah. in just because i hadn't hadn't done that internal work deep enough yeah um which is which is super fascinating the how do you um with the brand hackers what are some of the i don't know again it's case by case point but what are some of the common things brands get wrong when coming to brand hackers and it's this is like to help people who may not even get in, get involved with brand yeah hackers, but just um some of the things people get wrong they i'm a broken record they don't know what they're actually asking for and that's not i do not need to be told we need this many emails written. I need to be told what I'm asking for is you to grow my brand awareness by X percent within this community. And I can help you get to that level of clarity. Um, but they're quite resistant to that process. So it's just, it's people just hate closing doors. They hate any, we all hate any decision that says I'm doing this thing and therefore I'm not doing these things. And so we tend to just stuff it all in and say, we just want you to do like, just, you know, all of our social and all of our emails and just like do all of our brand stuff. And it's like, we can, that's going to be way less effective than being very specific about driving rate of sale in one particular retailer in, in a given time period and getting comfortable we don't have the budget to do that well and also become a household name. So let's just do one job. So I'm trying to grow this, grow this podcast. Yeah. I'm do- doing the community. Th- well, I don't know whether it's community or events, but doing events, it went up in Manchester, had loads of people there, haven't got like an, a, a Slack channel or anything like that to like kind of facilitate that. But communities um, are one thing or audience. However, I've probably got the name of wrong of how it is. In terms of actually growing it, um, I'm not really doing anything, just constantly posting on LinkedIn. It's basically the only thing I'm doing and relying on word of mouth. What things do you think I could be doing to build more depth? Yeah. One, there's two two things I want out of this. Like build more depth with potential uh, listeners and um, 
listeners and community or audience, whatever you want to call it. And two, then just like, what are some of the things that could, you think I could do to pour gasoline on, on the growth and really push the message out there? So just, again, this is where it always start. To, let's be really clear what you mean by grow. So you want yeah. more listeners or you want yes. the same listeners to listen more? I want incremental new listeners coming in. You want new listeners coming in, cool. Do you care who those listeners are? Ideally, food and drink founders. Okay. How Ideally, many, but I mean, beggars how many do you want and how quickly do you want them? Yeah, so this is this this this, this is so good going through it. Like, um, <laughs> Half into my brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I hadn't even thought of that. Like, I mean, I'm pulling this right out of my ass right now. But like a hundred thousand, just just for for the okay. argument. So, so yeah. you start with what I call a who inspired business challenge, which is I'm going to get a hundred thousand new food and drink founders who don't currently listen to Hungry to listen to one episode of Hungry by the end of June, 2024. For example, you get that statement down and you stress test every bit of it. Like, does it really need to be 100,000? If it was 50,000, would I get to the same outcome? Like, why 100,000? What am I going to do with that 100,000? I'd be asking, you know, if I was like working with you, I'd be asking you all of those questions to be like, let's be really clear that 10,000 isn't good enough. Let's be really clear that you do just want them to listen to one. It's actually not more valuable for you to have someone that's listening to the whole series. Yada, yada, yada. Say you get that statement. You then go, right, okay, so... What that, what that begins to do is give you some sense of indication. So if you want 100,000 new founders, I can tell you straight up that doing small scale events is going to be a really, really tough way to get there. Because it's just like simple maths, right? You've got to get, you'd have to do 25,000 dinners before you'd got enough engagement to get you to your listener goal, for example. So you go, okay, that's probably not my route. I need a route that's going to be about reach. So, right, I need to, how am I going to find loads of food and drink founders? Firstly, I probably need to look beyond the UK because 100,000 is pretty big. Like, what's my market penetration? How, what percentage of UK food and drink founders would have to be listening for me to get to that number? Yeah, it's like all back. of this sort of stuff that's, that seems yeah, I looked at that. to come there's out. Eight, there's 8,671, I think, food and drink, small to medium sized food and drink businesses in the UK. Fine. So that's so your first, like, you know that's that's a really helpful data point. So you're looking for ten times UK penetration. Like that means you've got to go global. Penetration. What do you mean by that? Penetration, like percentage of your market. So if there's eight thousand in the UK and you want a hundred thousand in total, you're it, you're not going to do it from the. That's so obvious. You're not going to do it from the UK. So then you're like, how many food and drink founders are there in English speaking countries? Cool. Does that give me a big enough market? Like all of these questions. Yeah. And and as a rule of thumb, like you're never going to get 100% penetration of anything because like shampoo has, I'm going to get this wrong, there's like 90% category penetration of shampoo in the UK. So there's 10% of people who don't buy shampoo. The same with loo roll. There's like a percentage of people that don't buy loo roll. So no product has 100% penetration of anything. So you're not going to get 100% of the UK audience. You might get 50% would be a huge stretch goal. Mm-hmm. So to have 4,000 UK food and drink founders listening to it would be an amazing result. That means half of all UK food and drink founders have heard an episode of Hungry. That's incredible. So that's a more realistic goal. But you do all of this stuff and then you just, you begin to make, you begin to think about, right, who is your audience and where might they be interested in podcasts? So they might meet someone at an event, they might see something on LinkedIn, they might get an advert, blah, 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 blah. And then you work back from that and you choose your channels based on what your desired outcome is. So Like my back of an envelope answer to you would be you need to get really obsessed with how you go viral on LinkedIn because it's not about, if you want scale, it's not about being present on LinkedIn. It's about how you make sure your LinkedIn is seen by new audiences. How do you do that? I know it's a million dollar question. (laughs) Right, viral content, which is like a thing that I'm on a massive upskilling journey on at the moment um i've got a coaching call on after this just how you flip your content to to with the intention of getting a thousand likes and therefore that's seen by a million people and your chances of finding your target audience are way higher but you need well, to do I've... something different you, you need to change something in your formula to like supercharge your reach to your question on how am i going to pour gasoline over it stop pouring the same stuff pour something different that's so interesting. And what have you learned about that? I know because you've got to run shortly, but yeah, yeah. just 
Um, what have I learned? Because also you're, you've been very. Another question I got asked is mm. from people when and then you are speaking to you today is like Lottie's so good on LinkedIn. Like, what are are her tricks of the trade? Uh, so my so, so my tricks of the trade. So so I I'm at like a tip. I'm trying to be at a bit of a tipping point with my LinkedIn. So so far for years and years, I've shown up every day really authentically i've tried to be really honest i've tried to make sure that the first line is engaging and i've been made it really human i've put my face out there a lot and i've tried to say stuff that no one else is saying out loud just tried to like be me that's got me this far i get 10 15,000 impressions for everything i post which is great. I've got 21,000 followers. Amazing. It's literally changed my business. Best, best, single best thing I've ever done was commit to LinkedIn. It's not going to get me to the point where I can triple my business. It's not going to grow. Like my pace of growth is slow and steady and I can map it out. I've got enough historic data to go, this is how fast it grows. This is how far it will continue to grow. If I want to change the pace of growth to my LinkedIn, I need to change the kind of content I'm putting out. So like, You'll see me doing a lot of wild experiments at the moment. I'm in like full test and learn mode. <laughs> so some like weird stuff coming out and I'm like asking my audience to kind of come along the journey with me. I promise I'll summarize it all when I've got a bit further down the line. But it's basically about thinking way more universally. So I need anyone who sees my content to see some relevance in it, not just my existing community to see relevance in it. And that's that's what's going to make me go viral. So I can't assume any any prior knowledge. I can't assume you've heard of me before. I can't assume you work in marketing. I can't assume you're in the UK. I can't assume you care about what I do. I've got to think about what is generically interesting. And what that will do, if it goes to plan, is create some viral moments where I will get 200,000 impressions, which drives a whole load of profile views which converts into followers for people who are like, oh, this is interesting to me. So it's kind of just like throwing a massive fishing net out every week or so. And then like letting the people that are interested come in and convert. And then alongside that, I'll do content that carries on to just like tell my story and explain what I do and like build that relationship with my followers. 